It's good to see y'all out tonight. Would you turn to 366, please? 366. Now, we're small in number tonight, but we've got some good singers out there. But y'all, y'all shout out now. Lord, lay some soul upon my heart. That should be our prayer every day. Lord, lay some soul upon my heart. Sing the first verse. Here we go. Lord, lay. Good evening. It's uh, I am glad to be home. Um, thank you all for uh, your prayers as we uh, we're at our executive committee meeting. I will uh, I'll give a brief update at the end on some things, and we'll cut that off if you don't mind. Okay, that way, I mean, I mean stuff I can't share. I just would rather not share it publicly. I'll just share that uh, with us. Um, Tonight we'll be in Psalm 27, Psalm 27, um, according to the title of this psalm in the Septuagint. Now the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, okay? According to it, uh, David wrote it, quote, before he was anointed, um, which means, especially if you look at the context, that it was probably written when David was exiled from his home. And being hunted by Saul, uh, so basically Saul's on. I mean, uh, David is on the run. Uh, is probably the context of Psalm 27. So the this psalm reveals that David was in great danger, as he was prone to be often in his life, and there were people lying about him, wanting to kill him, destroy him, uh, keep him from becoming king, the whole thing, and. Regardless of all the circumstances, which aren't 100% clear, okay, but regardless of those, David was confident in, despite his circumstances, in spite of his circumstances, and he remained very courageous in spite of everything going on, not because of who he was or because he knew how to swing a sword or because he was powerful or anything. He was confident in the Lord, um, and because of that, he remained unafraid, even though he was fearful. He had things that he was, he was concerned about. And so I love one thing about the Psalms is that it's very honest about real life. I mean, and we need to be reminded that the Bible itself <laughs> is honest about life. It doesn't gloss over what life's like. It doesn't, it doesn't minimize things. It doesn't um, take away from things. It's, it gives us an honest picture of what life is really like. And so this Psalm... Uh, is about how God himself can help us battle or uh, address or uh, look at our fears. And so it's going to be really three fears that he's going to, to show how God helps with, three fears that, that God helps us with. And so we're going to read Psalm 27. We're going to read the first six verses first. It says, The Lord is my light and my salvation whom shall I fear? Now, when it says the Lord is my light, I believe this is the first time in the Old Testament we see God being used as a metaphor for light. You know, by God is my light. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries, and my foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. 
One thing have I asked of the Lord that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. The, the first um, thing that David shows is that God helps us uh, with the fear that we have surrounding our own circumstances. David, is, I think, is very honest about the things around him. He talks about, whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid of? Talks about evildoers, adversaries. Talks about armies encamping against them. Talks about war, right? Like, I think these are honest depictions of the fears that he has. People are out to kill him, (laughs) right? I mean, that's generally something you might want to be concerned about. I mean, let's just be honest. He's concerned about it. So David honestly is looking around his life looking at everything going around it, but he's also looking at it through a lens of faith because he doesn't just say, I'm afraid. He says, whom shall I fear? But he's acknowledging that by earthly standpoints, I ought to be a fear, full of fear or afraid. I, I, I ought to be this way. But he, he poses it in a question because he knows who's in control. He speaks of fear and of fear of people, I think this means that he knows that there are people he ought to be afraid of. But he's saying God helps us with that. God is all we need, so we need not fear. If God is our strength, we need not fear our weaknesses. Right? If God is our strength, we need not fear our weaknesses. In his own strength, he ought to be afraid of the army around him of the people trying to kill him and take his life he ought to be afraid but then he says one thing I've asked of the Lord that will I seek after that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord for he will hide me in his shelter when in the day of trouble and for him it looks like that day of trouble is like at the present right um Again, this is the first time in Scripture we see that light is being used as a metaphor uh, for God. But the picture there is that around darkness, we know what's going on because God is our, our light. So David fully trusted the Lord in spite of the circumstances, okay? Uh, Romans 8, 31, if God be for us, who can be against us, right? Now, please understand that verse does not mean we're going to win everything, right? Like, uh, as a coach, sometimes you've heard coaches kind of take scriptures out of context. <laughs> That's going to mean we're going to win. That doesn't necessarily mean that. Like, you may lose what you're doing. Like, you may not defeat cancer or, you know, none of us, unless Jesus returns, are going to defeat death. It's going to happen to everyone unless Jesus returns. But if God can be a for, for us, who, who shall we be afraid of? Nobody. Why? Because ultimately, even if we die, even if we lose everything, we still have the Lord. And we still have eternity to look forward to. Because that's what he's saying, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. Well, if this is the Psalm of David, has the temple even been built? No. <laughs> Where's the house of the Lord? It's eternity he's talking about. Right? Like, so he's looking way past his circumstances even though he's looking at them like we can still be honest about where we are and still look out there right we can still look ahead uh and 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 know that we can have um relief from the fear of our circumstances doesn't mean we need to be naive and act like they don't exist okay uh you know i've seen sometimes people be super spiritual you know, and um, for example, let's say generally guys, most of us men, if we don't change our diet or our lifestyle maybe, but when we have a heart attack, sometimes I've seen people say, well, you know, I ought to get a little serious about that, right? Even though there may have been 10 years where the doctor said you need to make some lifestyle changes. 
But when the emergency happens, all of a sudden we change. Like, I've seen some people use things like that to say, well, I'm going to be okay. I'm just going to trust the Lord. Well, okay, I understand what you're saying, but don't be completely naive to the circumstances we have. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. We can be honest about who we are and where we are while being faithful, but let's not just act like we aren't where we are, right? So that's the first, the first thing he helps us deal with our circumstances. Now let's see 7 through 10. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger, O you who have been my help. Cast me not off, forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my mother and my father have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Um, this is a little different, especially when he talks about his father and his mother, but we'll get to that. Um, I think what we see here is that God helps us overcome our fear of failure. Right? Um, look, at the, look at what he says. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me, answer me, seek my face. He says, David's confidence in the Lord didn't prevent him from being concerned about himself. Okay? He was concerned about it. Your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O oh, you who have been, past tense, been my help. Cast me not off. Forsake me not. Right? Then he talks about his father and mother forsaking him, but the Lord will take me in. Um, Warren Wearsby, on his commentary on this, he kind of goes back to the verse about dwelling in the house of the Lord in this section. He says, this is his quote. He says, it's one thing to behold the Lord in the sanctuary and quiet at something else to see the enemy approaching on the battlefield. What if there was something wrong in David's life and the Lord abandoned him in the midst of the battle? When David cried out, God answered him in his heart and said, Seek my face. When the Lord's face shines upon us, it means he is pleased with us and will help us. If he's surrounded by the enemy, which he's already talking about, right? The armies are surrounding him. And it's almost as if now he is going out to battle. And he's like, don't, don't forsake me now. <laughs> like now, I mean, I trusted in you. But now I'm in the thick of it. And I need you to stay with me. Sometimes we shift and I mean, sometimes we know something's looming. And it's only when you're in the thick of it that you realize what you got into yourself into. Um, I'm, I'm going to give a, a small report on the executive committee stuff. My first meeting months ago, like I knew stuff was out there, but it was only when I showed up, I was like, I have, I have no clue what I've gotten myself into, right? Um, sometimes those experiences help you in the next one, right? I was a little bit more prepared this time than I was last time. Um, so we don't want to be clueless again. We want to have faith in the Lord, trust in the Lord. But here he is now. It's like now it's time to pull, you know, pull up the sword and get to work kind of thing. And he's like, God, don't, don't abandon me, right? Because if God abandons him, he will fail. And I don't know. Some of us, you know, I don't like to fail at anything. I don't like losing at stuff. I'm super competitive, nowhere near as bad as I used to be unless you talk to my wife, uh, <laughs> right? Like I hate losing at card games. It doesn't matter. I'm a lot better than I was. Stop it. No, I'm not. I used to be a sore winner as well. Look, well, I don't, the only body that beats me in Monopoly is my dad, and he always beats me. So that's good for my humility, right? So, um, but <laughs> usually I like to be the bank, right? So the point is, is like none of us like to lose at things. We don't like to fail. And some of us are worse at that, and, and that's a, that, it is a pride thing. It's a pride thing for most of us. But the idea is none of us wants to fail. But David also knows here if he fails here, if he dies in battle, he doesn't become king. I mean, God's already promised him, you're going to be king. And not only that, he knows that eventually not only is he going to be king, like there's this covenant with him. So if David fails, on paper God would fail because that would mean God's not good to be trusted. So there's a lot on him on this, right? Then he talks about his father and mother forsaking me. Now, we, have, we don't really have any scripture that says his father and mother forsake, uh, forsook him. Um, and really and truly, God cares. I think the idea here is God cares for us the way a good mother and a good father care for their children. But God is so much better than that, right? Like, as, as good a 
parents as you could have had. It's, I mean, it's nothing the way God cares for us. Um, I think that's the picture. Or uh, at least I think that's the picture. It's a weird comparison in verse 10. I think he's just trying to say God's better than that, you know. Um, so God helps us overcome our fear of failure. Now let's look at 11 through 14. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. In this one, if he's been in the battle, because you, you can't really tell here from 11 through 14, is, the, is he writing this in the midst of the battle or after the battle? You can't really tell from the language. Um, did, he, did he write it after? Or is he writing it during? We, we, just, we just don't know. But his big point is, verse 13, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord where? In the land of the living. He just said, um, one thing I've asked is that I will dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. He's talking about eternity. But now he's also like, but I believe I'm going to keep doing I think I'm going to keep living. So I think he's like, God, if you take me now, it's okay. But I'd rather still live. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of like what Paul said, to, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Right? Paul says, to live is Christ. Like, if I get to stay, I'm going to keep doing what God's called me to do. I'm still going to keep preaching the gospel. I'm going to enjoy my friends, my, my, my fellowship. I'm going to bless the church. I'm going to serve. I'm going to do all these good things. But if I die, I get to go be with Jesus. I'm a winner either way. Uh, that's what he, I think that's really what David's saying. But here I think God helps us overcome our fear of the future. Life really is a battle. And it's varying battles of intensity and duration sometimes. You know, we, we don't always see it coming. David, in this sense, does see this one coming, right? Uh, we don't always win the, know when they're going to happen. Um, that's why, again, I think it's a much better idea of, you know, not putting our head in the sand, let's look at where we are, be honest about the circumstances we're in. I think that's best. But life is a battle. So perhaps the enemy had retreated. You know, maybe they were around him, then he woke up and they weren't. Maybe he went out to battle and won. We don't know. This, we don't know what happened. But he's very confident that God's going to be the one that pulls him through. Um, <clears throat> Andrew Bonner was a Presbyterian Scotsman during, I think during the end of the Reformation and he said, it's one of my favorite quotes, he said, let us be as watchful after the victory as before the battle I love that quote you know, if you know you're about to be surrounded and attacked, something tells me you are ready, you're, you're dialed in, but sometimes after we win, we do something good, it's easy to just kind of take that edge off, right like, I can breathe, I can relax and sometimes we can, but sometimes we can't right um, we need to be aware all of the time. And then in verse 13, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord. I love that verse. Um, David believed that in God's goodness, he would be taken care of. Because he says, in the land of the living. God's good. I think also he's saying God can be trusted at his word. He's made a covenant with me, so I know I'm going to live. Right? Right? Um, but then, then he says that. Then he says, wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage, wait for the Lord. If, if David had not believed in God's goodness in the land of the living, then why go to war? You know, like, why fight to begin with? If, if he didn't think that he was going to, you see what I'm saying? Like, he, he trusted in God's goodness and followed him in faith. But also, even though he believed God would protect him, even though he knew God was gonna, gonna give him the victory, he still waits on the Lord, right? Now think about that. I had to think about that a little bit today. Um, man, if I was David, I, you know, talk, talk about not being like not liking to lose. Like if I just knew God was gonna win every battle, man, I would have just been out in front. You know what I mean? Like, I, you see what I'm saying? Like if you knew without a shadow of doubt, no matter what you did, to a certain extent, God was gonna give you victory. Like, I'd be all the way out. Like, let's just go ahead and kill everybody. Because David had the time twice to kill Saul, right? 
He'd already been anointed king. By, by, he, he knew God had called him king. He was anointed king. He was just waiting. I would have just said, this is my chance. Thank you, Lord, for giving me this victory like you promised. But David never did that. He waited. I think that's a good point. We can be overly confident, too. He says, wait. Like, wait on the Lord. Be strong. Wait on the Lord. Be strong. Take courage. But wait. It sounds very familiar to me to Joshua 1, 6, and 9. He says, be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all, <coughs> excuse me, all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. And then he says, uh, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. In those handful of verses, God tells Joshua three different times, be strong and courageous. Why do you think he told him three times? I think Joshua was afraid. <laughs> I mean, I think that's why God is telling him like. I mean, I think he's speaking exactly to his current need. He's, you know, Joshua at this point is filling in for Moses, the man that spoke to God face to face like a friend, the Bible says. And now he's got to fill in for that guy and do what Moses himself couldn't even do. Be strong and courageous. I think that in a sense is almost like what he says. So if we trust in the Lord, our future is good. And we have nothing to fear, even if there are things that make us afraid. Does that make sense? Like, we have nothing to fear, even if there are things that make us afraid. Um, and so I think that's one reason, um, one reason I think the Psalms are so good for us is, again, like I said in the beginning, like, they're so very honest about life. And so um, that is Psalm 27. Um, and then... Next week, we talk about God being, or the Lord being our strength and our shield, kind of continues that battle kind of, kind of thought. Um, all right, now let's look at our uh, prayer list.